Good morning, everyone. This is webinar 12 of OE Global 21. Thank you all for joining us. We have three amazing sessions this morning. And I'm Gina Fransman, and I will be your MC for this morning, basically, in a virtual showcase. Um, about myself, just very quickly, I'm the coordinator for the academic literacies at Nelson Mandela University here in Treberge, which was Port Elizabeth, South Africa. Um, I'm also, I'm also the project leader of the Open Education Influences Project, uh, which is a student advocacy and empowerment online course. Six modules open, Ubuntu, advocacy, facilitation, influencing, and then the sustainable development goals. It's hosted on our engage.mandela site and powered by Moodle. So thrilled to say. So I'm thrilled to be here and have the leads from Moodle as one of the three sessions as well. I'm happy to say that two of our instructional designers from Mandela Uni are in the room as well, Koshila and Andrew, and can share with all of you that part of their jobs are literally to help our university and community use and engage with Moodle for teaching, for learning. And so a we'll shout out to the two of them. Uh, we now have two open project courses from Open Education for a Better World here at Mandela University. And they are on the Moodle site and freely available. Mine's called Becoming an Open Ed Influencer. And then Earl Mentor, who's here too, hi Earl. Um, his course is called Peace Building in High Risk Communities in South Africa. And uh, you can find that page on OEG Connect as well. Today, I'm super excited to facilitate the session. So here we go. As we go, do add your questions, your comments, and especially your kudos for the speakers um, to the chat window. You feel free to use those emojis in the chat window to signal your likes, your applause, and other reactions during the presentations, please. Presenters, as we go through the full session and you are done or waiting to present, uh, it may be good to copy and paste all questions directed to yourselves or your projects into a document so we can engage with them in the Q&A. Moitza, who is our rapporteur for today, will be helping us do so and so that we don't miss any valuable insights or feedback to you and your project. I think everyone's posted their presentations on their project pages of OEG Connect. So audience members, please sit back and relax as we begin. About the sessions, and I will do this in order as they um, are about to begin. So for number one, it's re-engineering open education practices for systemic change. The presenters are Sharonika P. Karunanayaka and Som Naidu. And in this webinar, they discuss four initiatives implemented by the OUSL, that's the Open University of Sri Lanka, since 2013 in relation to promoting the adoption of OER and OEP among practitioners at various levels. All these initiatives address the UNESCO OER recommendation one, strategically plan and support OER capacity building, awareness raising, use creation and sharing at the institutional and national levels targeting all education sectors and levels. The focus in the webinar is on the capacity development of individuals as well as educational institutions. Sharonika and Sam, I will just hand over to you. Have fun. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Gino, for that introduction. Uh, greetings everyone from Sri Lanka. Uh, first of all, my apologies for not being able to switch on the video due to some technical uh, issue I'm having. Uh, however, um, I'll share my screen now. Um, we'll start the presentation. So, okay. Um, as uh, Gino uh, gave a small introduction, uh, our um, presentation is uh, based on um, several initiatives uh, we have implemented at the Open Institute of Sri Lanka. I'm from the Faculty of Education of the Open Institute of Sri Lanka and my colleague Som Naidu uh, from Melbourne, Australia. Uh, and together we have initiated and implemented a series of uh, capacity development uh, initiatives on the adoption of OER and OEP uh, since 2013 continuously as several cycles. Uh, so, uh, uh, actually, we have uh, uh, all these are research projects and we have published a lot. 
uh, on all these initiatives. So uh, we are not going to focus on that aspect. Uh, but in this presentation, uh, our um, key focus is on uh, bringing about systemic change in the adoption of OER and OEP through our efforts. Uh, so uh, let me uh, give some uh, brief introduction to each of these initiatives and the methodologies we have adopted and the findings. Uh, and at the end, some will, uh, some will uh, discuss about uh, the uh, lessons learned and about the systemic change, how, uh, how it happened, or how, how, we, um, how our uh, initiatives uh, made that happen uh, as we believe so. Okay, so let me um, move forward. Uh, all these uh, initiatives are linked with uh, addressing the first objective of the UNESCO recommendation on OER that is about building capacity of stakeholders to create access reuse, adapt, and redistribute OER. So uh, all these uh, areas which, is, which are emphasized in the recommendation have been addressed in all our initiatives, as you will see when I briefly describe them. So these are the four initiatives in brief. Um, in 2013, uh, actually at that time, OER was a totally new concept for us at the Open Institute of Sri Lanka. We have heard the word OER, you know, at conferences, uh, you know, uh, different uh, instances, but there was not quite a clear understanding about the OER. So um, uh, at that time at the Faculty of Education, I was the Dean of the Faculty of Education. So uh, with the support from the Commonwealth of Learning, uh, we initiated a project to raise awareness and capacity building uh, about uh, integrating OER into our teacher education programs. And so was the facilitator for this uh, project. And that's how we started our OER journey, OER and OEP journey in 2013. So that uh, initiative was uh, uh, restricted to the Faculty of Education. We are 30, the, all, all um, members of the Faculty of Education, that is 30, a small number in our faculty. All of us engaged in this initiative, in this project, and we developed, uh, we raised awareness and developed capacity and integrated OER into our um, online course development. So it uh, uh, resulted in five, uh, five teams worked on it. Uh, and five online courses with OER integration happened. So afterwards, with this experience, the next initiative uh, from the Faculty of Education, we wanted to move out to the other faculties. At that time at the OUSL, there were four faculties, uh, in addition to education, humanities and social sciences, and the science, natural sciences and the engineering. So uh, uh, as this next project again, so uh, as the facilitator, and with the support from uh, SEMCA, that is Commonwealth Educational uh, Media Center for Asia, uh, we initiated uh, a fully online pro professional development program on OER-based e-learning for educators, for all educators at the Open Institute of Sri Lanka. Uh, so actually that's an adaptation of an existing course uh, originally developed by SEMCA with uh, Vavasan Open University. We adapted it and implemented it. Uh, then the third step was interesting. We moved out of the Open Institute of Sri Lanka uh, and that is uh, from the university um, system, we went out to the school system in Sri Lanka. That's an initiative uh, supported uh, under the, uh, as part of the row 4 d project. Uh, many of you are, uh, know about that uh, during 2015-16. And uh, it was uh, quite big because uh, it targeted all, uh, our, in Sri Lanka, we have nine provinces. So uh, we targeted teachers from all nine provinces that is throughout the country. Uh, and school, 230 school teachers were involved in that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, again, that was um, capacity development of school teachers in integrating OER into their practices. Then with all this experience, finally, uh, in 2017, we decided to go for a MOOC. Actually, that was the first MOOC uh, developed uh, at the Open Source of Sri Lanka. And as I believe uh, in, in any educational institution uh, at the in Sri Lanka, any higher educational institution, to my knowledge. So with that, we went out of the university. You know, we uh, opened it up for an for a global audience, uh, and uh, more than four hundred uh, uh, participants from twenty eight different countries 
participated in this. So in brief, all these uh, capacity development initiatives, uh, the main goal was to develop capacity among practitioners uh, at different sectors, at different levels, in different uh, areas of study, but they are all practitioners and uh, developing capacity on the adoption of OER and OP, which of course, uh, directly links with this OER recommendation because all these uh, interventions were strategically planned and supported the capacity development at different levels, national institutional, individual levels, institutional levels, and national levels uh, because the school uh, implementation was with, was with the support from the Ministry of Education at a national level and targeting all ed uh, education sectors and levels in Sri Lanka and uh, even outside. So that's uh, a brief introduction. As I mentioned, all these things are uh, very, uh, we have published a lot. Uh, I will, uh, I have put uh, those uh, references in the extended abstract and I will put some at the end uh, in the chat box as well. But for the purpose of this presentation, our key research question was how and to what extent the capacity development approaches employ to promote the adoption of OER and OEP has resulted in bringing about systemic change. So all these, so uh, answering the question how, uh, all these uh, initiatives were based on a common conceptual framework, which we call the learning engine framework, uh, which uh, uh, was adapted from the very first initiative. If you read our first uh, publication based on the first initiative, uh, the first book, um, it all explains what this uh, learning engine framework is about, but uh, the key focus here is about, uh, it's based on situated learning pr uh, principles where uh, the practitioners or the educators are situated in authentic learning scenarios and providing them with uh, real life uh, activities and tasks uh, to engage in during the experience uh, throughout uh, with the support of the resources uh, as OER. So that's uh, in very brief about the conceptual framework and uh, the methodology we adopted. Uh, it took a design-based research approach because all these initiatives were like uh, cycles of these iterative cycles of uh, uh, testing and refining the practices. Uh, each stage we started with analyzing uh, the current thinking and practices of practitioners in relation to their use of instructional methods and materials in the teaching learning process uh, because um, First, we had we are in it's a collaborative process between the researchers, the team. All these uh, we had very good uh, collaborative teams of researchers and the practitioner, uh, the participant team. So, in collaboration, we analyzed and uh, identified the uh, contextual needs and then designed a sequence of experiences to enhance their pedagogical thinking and practices related to the adoption of OER and OEP. So basically it's uh, enacting change towards uh, openness in their thinking and practices. Uh, and um, capacity development happened uh, throughout uh, using various methods, uh, interactive workshops, online learning environments, and finally reflecting to find solutions uh, to these authentic problems. So since they were all research projects, Throughout, data collection happened, mainly a qualitative, a process-oriented approach uh, was adopted. And we compiled all these reflections as lived experiences as on narratives of both practitioners and researchers. That's where all our publications came, up, came out. Uh, three books, which I, I showed at the very beginning, uh, they all have the voices of these uh, teachers and educators and practitioners who went through this process. And e results of each initiative fed on to the successive initiatives and enabled the refinement of design strategies. So uh, if I quickly go to the findings, of course, um, that the, we observed significant shifts of, uh, in the uh, perspectives and practices towards openness. Now, when we started from the faculty, 
the whole faculty are, got familiar with integrating OER into their courses. Of course, many of those uh, Mm, uh, people uh, have retired now, but the newcomers also, we are keeping up the practice. We are moving, I mean, uh, we are continuing with the practice. So the faculty, uh, it, it has become a continuous, uh, we are encouraging continuously to in integrate OER in their courses and the university, all the other faculties, uh, they are, are interested individuals in all faculties who have, uh, you know, initiated. And I would like to say this resulted in uh, developing an OER policy at the Open University of Sri Lanka as well. In the, during the first initiative, we didn't have an OER policy, but by the second initiative, because of the interest raised and the need for a policy came and we developed a policy also during this time where these researchers also gave inputs. And now we have integrated this into the um, staff development process when we are for the newly recruited lecturers this is included there in so it's a, it's also an ongoing practice and the school system from the school teachers it went to the students and to their peer teachers and even some teachers uh, conducted uh, you know workshops and their own initiatives for other teachers in other schools so it, it's like a uh, you know, rippling effect or, uh, you know, uh, moving from uh, individuals to mass uh, other parties out of their schools. Uh, so we observe a lot of uh, shifts, especially uh, I would like to mention about the language because in the T Sri Lankan context, most of the teachers are teaching in the local languages, Sinhala and Tamil, but most of the OERs are in English, but then uh, they were motivated even to prepare uh, in local language creation and then sharing with others and compiling. So all these shifts happen. And finally, the CPD MOOCs project also, we observed these thinking and practices. There were four CPD MOOCs, uh, one month duration of each. And during this, they are, the tasks were oriented in such a way to encourage them to become more creative, critical, reflective, and collaborative. Of course, challenge a lot of challenges are faced during these all these initiatives. Some common challenges are the cognitive load faced by these individuals, coping up with so many novel concepts, uh, the OER, OEP, and uh, using technology, uh, the language issues, and then innovative pedagogy. Uh, you know, moving from the traditional thinking. Of course, since they are all. Uh, working practitioners, full-time working practitioners, the workload, the high workload and the time constraints. So anyway, so that's the, um, you know, uh, an overview of our initiatives. And now I would uh, like to uh, give over to my colleague Som to um, elaborate on the lessons learned through these initiatives and some concluding remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Sharonika. You've got two minutes. I've, you've got me two minutes. You're 13 minutes. I was timing you. So here we go. The, 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 the beauty of uh, this work was the opportunity to work in almost a, a sort of, you know, a new space, a green field, if you like to call it. As uh, uh, Sharonika pointed out that, you know, in 2013 or so, uh, most of the faculty members had in, no idea about what, what OERs were. I mean, it, it, this is interesting because here was an open university which was in the business of open education and yet very unfamiliar with open educational resources. So in the seven years, what we were able to do is to bring about systemic change. I mean, I'm not suggesting that we have changed the culture or the academic culture towards a more open society and open, open uh, scholarly environment. We're a long way from that, but it was an opportunity to work from within a faculty, within a program, to take it throughout the university, and then to take it throughout the country. And again, the the advantages were that you know Sri Lanka is a, is, is is a big country, but a small country by by other standards. So here we were able to work across uh, borders, across institutional borders, and 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 take a global picture within the context of of a nation. And, uh, and that was an amazing opportunity to be able to engage in, in the scholarship of open educational practices, which is what we would like to call it as opposed to just OER and bringing about that change. So the, the point about uh, of, of this presentation 
is to is to describe how systemic change can be brought about and what the challenges are. I mean, as, as we have both said that, you know, the battle is not won yet, but we're a long way into the battle and we've got some really good um, uh, wins along, along the way. So that's the main point that, that we want to uh, bring across as part of this presentation through our individual projects, of course. And, um, and, and, and two things to just, uh, I just want to finish up with is that even though you can and you, you, you're able to do a lot of work at, 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 at the at grassroots level with individual people and getting people to adopt open educational resources, you know, educational practices, there has to be a, a counter balance from the institutional perspective. There has to be policy in place, there has to be leadership, and there has to be a top down um, uh, a force, if you like, uh, on, on, on to the activity. Otherwise, a grassroots activity alone is not going to is not going to cut it. So we found that working from both ends, you know, from from top down through leadership, uh, right from the vice chancellor down down to the to the academics in the department, and then working with school teachers and academics was 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 going to be crucial in, in in any any activity along these lines in any kind of change that you want to bring about in scholarship all right Gino I'm done thank you thank you very much uh, so uh, as I mentioned all these uh, I will be sharing all these links for anybody who would like to uh, get further information about our initiative thank you so much Thank you, Sharonika, and thank you, Sam. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, it's it's some amazing work that you're doing, and it's lovely to see how sort of smaller initiatives can be amplified to a national level. So well done for what you've done in Sri Lanka. Um, I actually began the session without um, introducing the, the two presenters properly. So just a, a small bit about both of them, because now you see the wonderful work that they do and you don't necessarily know where they are uh, situated professionally. So Sharonika is a professor in educational technology in the Faculty of Education at the Open University of Sri Lanka. She's been an academic at OUSL since 1993 and served as the Dean of the Faculty of Education. She's an honorary advisor at the Commonwealth of Learning during 2019 to 2021. And her key research focus is on technology integration in teaching and learning, learning experience design, OER and OEP. Dr. Naidu is former Pro Vice Chancellor, Flexible Learning and Director of the Center for Flexible Learning at the University of the South Pacific is the Principal Associate in Technology, Education and Design Associates, and then Executive Editor of the journal Distance Education. I won't take up much more time. We will have uh, an opportunity to engage with lots of those questions and uh, comments that's in the chat. There's a lot of buzz happening there. Uh, for now, let's move on to our second session. Thank you to the first presenters. Now, up next, um, Moodle Net 2.0 as a platform for sharing and curating OER. Uh, Martin and Paul will be presenting this session. Uh, Dr. Martin Dagiamas is the founder and CEO of Moodle and the open source Moodle software project launched in 1999. It now includes Moodle LMS, Moodle Cloud, Moodle Workplace, Moodle Net, Moodle Academy, and more. From beginnings in Australia, he continues to guide and grow the enterprise with the support of 150 team members globally, 100 Moodle partner companies, thousands of collaborators, and hundreds of millions of users worldwide, including my university. Martin has multiple postgraduate degrees in computer science and education, and then two honorary doctorates from Spain and Belgium. Paul Hodgson is the other presenter, and he's the product manager of MoodleNet. He's got over 20 years experience in education, technology, and software project, uh, product management. Paul was an education technology director in higher education for 10 years, and he's been working with Moodle products for over 14 years as a host, administrator, developer, teacher, and trainer. He's also been responsible for digital content and educational innovation using digital technologies. 
Paul aims to make MoodleNet the largest federated open education resources platform globally. His postgraduate degree in information technology. Over to you, Martin and Paul. Break a leg. Oh, there won't be any leg breaking going on here. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for the intro, Gino. Uh, lovely. And um, Anna, thanks for that last talk. Um, so, yeah, a few of you may have heard me talk about MoodleNet um, for a while. And um, the reason why it has a 2.0 on it is because we, we had a previous version, which um, unfortunately we did a lot of work on and we actually trashed. We threw it away and we started again. Um, I'm happy to say we've got this new version to talk about and uh, I'm really happy about it and really proud to talk about it. So um, uh, let's get into it. Um, if you could skip to the next slide, uh, Paul. I can see you have an ultra wide monitor there. Um, so the, uh, the, the problem that we've been addressing is that a lot of people when they are tackling an online course, um, are given a blank screen. Um, you know, here's your empty course, and now you're facing a white wall. What do you do next? And you have to, you're responsible for getting your own content or finding your own content. Now, if you've started to do that with a new course, uh, you know, maybe you do have a lot of uh, old things that you had from your pre online days and you, you repurpose those. That's, that's good. Um, we can do a lot more on the web, as you know, than you could do with a lecture. So uh, it's good to have uh, uh, really engaging resources. And so you go out there and, and, you know, what we all want and why we're all here is we're, su we're supporting open education resources. And there is a ton of it out there. But um, it's not always easy to find and use. And so the, the main problems here are that there's a lot of repositories of OER. I've got a link there, I can post it, but there, there are hundreds of repositories around and some, some of them focus on different subjects or different, um, often usually different languages. Um, and uh, they're hard to go through them all. Uh, even when you search them and you find something that matches a search, it doesn't tell you what's good for your course. Uh, it, just because you found a textbook on physics doesn't mean that's going to make for an engaging physics course. Um, and that's, uh, that's something critical, I think. If we're going to create really powerful, good online education courses, we need great OER and, and more than just the, uh, the content, right? the text and the images and videos. What is the processes? What are the assignments? What are the types of forums you would want to run, uh, discussions, uh, uh, different activities. Um, even when you go out and Google and go and search the, the world's resources, uh, you, it's still not always easy to find what's good for a course. And, uh, and, and of course, you don't even know what OER, right? You have to check all the licenses one by one. So it ends up being a huge time consuming process. Why is every teacher having to do that over and over again, even though we have so much OER? So what we are trying to do with MoodleNet is solve that by having a structure that allows all the educators so to, to curate collections of OER. Um, once somebody who's really good at a topic collects resources, great resources that they are using and they've tested and they find are working really great for that subject, that's, that itself is content, that's knowledge that we wanna be sharing. And so MoodleNet is the place for those curated collections. Um, the other aspect is we were, it's integrated with the LMS, with Moodle and in future other LMSs, um, so that you can jump out of your course to get there and push that stuff back into your course and it's all very uh, at your fingertips. And we've designed this as open education technology. It's not a commercial product. None of our stuff is, or one of our things is, but generally Moodle is we're huge open source uh, um, uh, makers and uh, supporters. So we're building this so that it can be run by lots of people. Uh, it can support all languages, all sectors and all contexts. So you can run your own MoodleNet server um, just maybe you specialize on one particular subject, you can put all that stuff in there 
and it will be connected with all the other Moodle Net servers and found from anywhere in the world. Um, important to, uh, last thing I want to mention here is that primarily we're thinking about using it to link to existing OER that's already out there. Um, however, it also supports uploading of files into it as well. So it can also be a repository. Um, so our new project manager running the project and uh, who has just launched a, a beta site last week is Paul Hodgson. Ho Paul Hodgson, so I'll hand over to Paul. Take it away. Thanks, Martin. Uh, just uh, I've changed my screen a little bit so I can demo to you uh, the actual system. I hope that's okay. And you can see it. Um, so essentially, yes, we, we came in. I've been with Moodle now three months trying to, uh, to, to put the first uh, beta level together. Um, we came in with an approach essentially of uh, a new redesign, which is around a new user experience. Uh, for those of you that have seen Moodle Net before, um, I, I will show you it, so I won't go into too much detail there. Uh, but some principles are that guests can find and use resources. So firstly, you don't have to be logged in uh, to actually find resources and use them. Um, that was very important from an anonymity point of view, privacy point of view. If they're open, you don't need to log in. Um, if you do log in and you do have an account on your our Moodle net or your Moodle net, um, validated people then have full access to everything, uploading resources, curating collections, uh, following people, that sort of thing. Um, if you do upload a resource, it can be tagged with the standard I said subjects. We've humanized this somewhat, so it's not ungainly. Um, we have added Creative Commons licenses, which must be selected if you upload something, um, and other metadata to make what Martin was talking about, which was uh, make it useful, make it easy to find things uh, as well. Um, collections can be actually owned by one person um, and can be followed by other people. So you can create a collection of any name, any reference, and have that followed by educators who are looking for content anywhere. Um, you can use bookmarks and likes, like a social uh, kind of thing, and that leads into some form of kudos and points on the system, so you can build your own profile, and of course it's integrated with Moodle LMS, so you can send any resource, um, if you've set it up in Moodle LMS, straight into your course from MoodleNet. Um, importantly, just a little bit about metadata, Martin mentioned there about the things that you can actually add to the resource. Um, we added these as um, optional because, as we know, a lot of faculty don't want to spend too long uploading their resources and classifying their metadata, but it is very useful to, to, to other people to do that. So we do encourage people to do that through points, through kudos, through gamification eventually. Um, but essentially the subjects, licenses, what is it, what type of resource is it? And that's based on um, the learning object model of the IEE. Um, and also you can do all MIME types, so you can upload to it or you can link to anything anywhere as well. And it's easy to translate because it's based on ISO and can be done on the server side. Just a little intro there. Um, I'd really like to show you the system more than anything else because uh, actually speak louder than words, just swapping over. So here we go. So Moodle.net, it's there right now. As you can see um, on the screen at the bottom, there is a link to Moodle.net Beta. If you want to um, get involved in any documentation, that's where you go to if you want to report bugs, ask for features, that sort of thing. And you can see at the moment, I'm not logged in um, at all. So I'm a, a blank user. I can join or I can log in. But actually, I can start using this without. So if I start looking for, say, um, resources on the earth, it will give me what's in the system there straight away. These subjects are the ISED subjects, and I can go straight into here and see what's under that subject. Are there any collections from other people around that, that topic? And what resources do we have on that topic as well? Um, so if I click on the, on the Earth, you'll see um, Earth Sciences has four followers, zero collections, and three resources. And you'll notice here that I cannot follow this because I'm anonymous. I don't have an account on MoodleNet. Once I have an account, I can follow. So I look at one of these resources. This has been curated by, oh, look, it's by me. So, uh, you know, this is my account. So you'll see it's working. And it's essentially a website link. So I can open that link and have a look straight in there. I can send that to my Moodle LMS into my course immediately. Um, or I can just um, look at who's done this because they might be a person of interest. So I can look at their profile and see what else they've done, what their collections are. Um, 
and there's a measure of sort of how useful they are on the system as well as in useful to other people not as in useful in that they've got kudos and followers and, and a number of resources um, you'll notice from the privacy point of view um, that i'm a guest remember i can't follow and i can't message this person okay so the privacy is very important to us as well so if i was to log in i'm just going to uh, switch my screen here so i'm now going to log in as myself um, if you want to sign up you can you can do that right now um, it's a simple email validation sign up so you are sent an email link and you click on it and it validates your account it then takes you to your profile which you'll see any second when i log in so as soon as you validate your account you're taken to your profile and you can edit various things about you there's a little edit button there you can see and i can change my profile picture my cover um, my web link my location my description um, and save that back to build your profile. Now, if I do the same thing as I did before, which was to come into the system and look for Earth type things, I get exactly the same results. But now, when I go and look at Earth sciences, one second, there we go. You can see now I can follow and unfollow this as a, I said, subject. So anything is added, it will appear in my, uh, in my following, which I will show you in a moment. And if I look at the same results I did before, I can now do exactly as I did before, except because it's my own resource, I can edit it and I can add more net metadata. I can uh, change things around a little bit. I can delete it. Um, I can also like it if it wasn't mine and I can bookmark it for later if I wish as well. The only other thing is that I can add it to collections. Now these collections belong to me, but are public. So I could say, Oh, this is an open education research resource. I'll add it. Done. And then essentially, when you look at my profile and you go to the open education research, it's added it there. So if anyone else is following that, they would now have that as part of their resources as well. OK, so profiles can be followed by people. So essentially, if I was to look around here and say, okay, I'm going to look for something uh, in languages because all I'm looking for is who is a, a person on this system who is into languages or there's a language resource. And we can see this is uh, uploaded by Anna who's on the call now. Um, and I can either use her resource or I can follow and unfollow her and I can message her on the system as well. There's nothing given away here. There's no personal data being shown, no email addresses, nothing. It's all very private, but Anna will receive this as an email right now. Um, eventually we're going to get into messaging, um, but we're working on that right now. And I can see Anna's documents. I can like them. And if I like them, you watch her kudos. Her kudos go up, more likes she gets on her resources. I can bookmark them and unbookmark them so that they appear on my bookmarks list as well. Okay, now what I'd like to do is to just go through the, the steps of creating something for you. So if I, I'm gonna start with a collection. Why? Because if I had a resource, I want to add it to a collection that already exists and I don't have one. So I'm going to start with, with a new collection here. Um, I'm going to just put a cover image in here, just a second while I find the right one. Okay. So we're going to use this as a, an image, and this is going to be um, another oh yeah, collection. That's learning, and I can create a collection there. And essentially now in my profile, you'll see I have that collection ready for people to view. There's nothing in it, so, I can actually search here for OER. And it said we have something in Open Educore Research here, which is actually my collection. So I can add this to another one. What we'll end up with is a list of resources that become useful across the boundaries of subjects and collections because you can personalize these things. Um, you end up finding things in many, many different ways. And the more accurate we get people to do that, the more beneficial the system is to OER as a whole. Okay, let's just look at someone else's resource. I'm going to go back to, to Anna's resource here. Um, obviously, this is uh, not in English, so it's multi-language is supported as well. 
um, we have a, a capacity on the server to translate the whole site into other languages and we'll be asking for help in translations eventually. Um, I guess what you can see here that Anna has tagged this with the various metadata. I can't do anything with this other than read it, but it makes this really useful from a, a point of view of searchability um, as well. And all of these are based on that IEE, on uh, ISAID, on, on all these uh, standards. A little bit about licensing. Um, well, Anna hasn't actually listed this um, as a license anyway. Why? Because it's a link because there's no need for the, the link will come from the license itself. It, you know, it's not a, an open license for a link. Yeah. Um, so we could look at that one straight away, or we can use it in Moodle. I can add it to my collection. I can say, well, I'd like this in my OER connection and done. Now I have curated it for others. So if I go in there, it's in my collection as well. So anyone who's following my collection will actually see that as well. And finally, just to run you through uh, adding a resource here. So new resources um, are very varied, of course. We've designed the system to support any mind type. So it could be a link to a, a page going somewhere else, a video, a YouTube video, um, whatever the mind type is, but you can upload as well. Um, if you were to uh, upload a file, you can't see what I'm doing in the background, but if I do an image file, it will upload it and it will give you a thumbnail of the image file. Um, and it will also, you can see the, the name there, ask you for a Creative Commons license. You can't actually add this resource unless you select something. Uh, obviously, we're hoping everything is, is here, but, but possibly not, possibly not in the public domain. And we'll give it some data, and those are the ISED categories. Everything we've designed is based on start to type, and it will find essentially. So there's no need to scroll down uh, to lots and lots of different classifications. You can just type and find. So that will be in education. Um, I'm just going to use the same description for speed right now. And because it's me, it says you have three collections. Would you like to add it to any of these? Well, yes, I'll have it on open education resources. And then it starts to say to me, okay, this is the content type we want you to add. This is optional. I can click uh, create resource right now. Um, but obviously we'd like to encourage people to do these because it makes it searchable. So the contact type, um, we're gonna say this is a tutorial. It is for uh, primary education. It was created in February, 2019. And it is in Afrikaans as we have some South Africans on the call, why not? Um, and then I can create the resource. Now essentially that goes away and, and comes back exactly what you would see as a resource, which can now be downloaded because it's a file, it's not a link. It can be added to a collection, another collection, or it can be sent immediately to Moodle. Okay, so that's it. Apart from, and this is quite important, um, that if I was to go for earth sciences again, in terms of a, a trending subject, um, and I, was, I wanted to follow somebody, I could follow at the profile level. So if I go for, let's see, diet. Have we got anything on diet? Well, there's one on uh, NASCO. No, let's have a look at fitness. There we go. There's one in, in other languages um, by Mary, who many of you might know as well, who's a member of the Middle Team. Now, I can here follow and unfollow Mary a message as before, but actually, I can also follow her collections. So if she is of interest, but I don't want to follow at the profile level, I can do it at the, uh, at, the, um, at the collection level as well. The nice thing about this as well, of course, when you send to Moodle, and I'm not going to do this because it has to be configured in Moodle to, to actually work, but I've got some screenshots to show you. Um, if you have Moodle and it supports Moodle 3.9 or later, um, if you have Moodle set up and you have the, the instance activated in your Moodle setup, then essentially, you have a browse content from Moodle Net button automatically already in Moodle when you add an activity and you can bring things straight across from uh, Moodle Net itself. So there you go. That's the system. I've put all these screenshots in the presentation if you want to download it later. Um, but where now? What do we do next? Well, you can use it now. Um, we're asking that you use it for educational content because we're trying to build the first version of something that's useful. I know that people are going to go in and test it, um, but you can delete your resource afterwards if it's not educational. 
um, try and do something useful, tag it up and see if people find it would be great. Um, so you can start using it now. You can help us by giving us feedback, giving us comments on uh, usability, on bugs, on oh, it would be nice to see this feature. And you can do that all through our Moodle Net Tracker, uh, which we use across Moodle as an organization. Um, and if you'd like to get in touch with us to help at the institutional level of having your own Moodle Net, we will do a limited number of these coming in the next few months to, uh, to actually push this out and, and learn about the industry. Um, and that's it. We're looking for devs. We're looking for help. Uh, we're looking to grow MoodleNet into a large global system, uh, open source, free, secure, and anonymous. Thanks very much. Um, if you have any questions, we're happy to answer. Thank you, Martin, and thank you, Paul. This looks amazing. Um, I'm, I'm so excited and being Moodle users at Mandela University um, and really like going on a, on quite a steep learning curve since COVID hit last year. Um, like this is an exceptional resource for us to definitely try. Um, I put into the chat there, yes, please add us to that um, user list um, so that we can also engage and give you feedback, please. Um, thank you so much. I think that we'll move on to the third session for today, um, which is titled Radical Openness, Incremental Design, Maximizing the Reach of OER Capacity Development Through Open Principles. The presenters today are Claire Good, Wayne McIntosh, and Simon Wood. And in this presentation, they review how the OER Foundation's award-winning open education copyright and open licensing in a digital world micro course has evolved and contributed to building capacity of stakeholders to create, access, reuse, adapt, and redistribute OER. And that's the UNESCO recommendation on OER or a portion of that since the course's inception in 2011. So about the presenters today, Wayne McIntosh is the founding director of the OER Foundation headquartered in Otago Polytechnic Limited in New Zealand. He is, is at Otago. He is coordinating the establishment of the OERU, an international innovation partnership, which aims to widen access to more affordable education for all. Wayne holds the UNESCO chair in OER and serves as a member of the board of directors of the OER Foundation. He's a strategy innovator with a passion for open sourcing education. The next presenter is Simon Wood, uh, who is a teaching, a learning and teaching specialist at Otago Polytechnic in New Zealand, where her focus is developing the capability of academic staff to use technology to support learning and teaching. Since 2018, she's also been seconded part-time from the Polytechnic to work on OERU projects, including course design and marketing automation. The third presenter is Claire Good, Good with an E. She is a learning tech and teaching specialist and principal lecturer in the learning and teaching development team at Otago Polytechnic in New Zealand. Claire works alongside academic staff across the Polytechnic to build their capacity or capabilities in multiple aspects of pedagogical experience in practice. This includes program and course design, assessment strategies, technology enhanced learning, blended delivery, the development of resources for lifelong learning, and continuing professional development. All of this to ensure the best possible experience and outcomes for learners. Claire's also one of the elected staff representatives on the Polytechnics Leadership Council. Claire, Wayne, and Simon, uh, Please go ahead, welcome, and have fun. Over to you. Kia ora, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for not wishing us to break our legs, <laughs> as you did with the other groups, that's good. Um, so thanks very much for uh, being with us for this uh, this presentation, which I think fits in well with the um, the other ones that we, we've had in this, uh, this session, uh, looking at things, similar things from a different angle. So, Yes, our title, Radical Openness, Incremental Design. What we're actually gonna to do to illustrate this is to tell you the story of a course. And the, this course is open education 
copyright and open licensing in a digital world. Uh, it's a capacity building course for open education and it is itself freely accessible and constructed entirely from OER. Um, and is, um, is licensed under a CC by SA license. Now through the story of the development and evolution of this course, we'll illustrate how the two guiding principles, um, and those are a deep commitment to openness that we've called radical openness and an incremental design approach have supported the two UNESCO OER recommendations that are covered in this webinar. So that's, uh, as we've mentioned before, capacity building and inclusive and equitable OER. And actually, uh, there's quite a bit of international cooperation in the fifth uh, UNESCO uh, recommendation in here as well. So how we're going to do this, um, we're going to talk about who's behind this course. Um, how did it start and what has it become? Uh, we're then going to talk about who's using it now, both in terms of institutions and learners. And then Wayne's going to finish up for us by explaining just how we believe that our approach of radical openness um, helps, uh, helps us to um, fulfil the UNESCO OER recommendations. So, as we mentioned uh, in the introductions, um, Wayne is, amongst other things, the Managing Director of the OER Foundation, and he also heads up the OER Universitas, which is normally known as the OERU. And you'll hear us mention these two organisations quite a few times in our presentation, so I'm just going to explain them briefly here. So the OER Foundation, it's a New Zealand based educational charity that was founded in 2009 by Otago Polytechnic, um, the place where Claire and I work for most of the time. Um, and it provides its mission is to provide leadership in support of open education through various projects. And for the purpose of this talk, there are two projects that are particularly relevant, so I'll mention them now. So one of them is Wiki Educator. So Wiki Educator is a, an online platform for collaborative OER course design uh, based on the same, uh, same technology as Wikipedia. The other project is the OERU. Now this is um, it's an international network of over 40 institutions in seven global regions. Networks uh, been around for several years now, uh, growing all the time. Um, and what it does is it offers freely accessible first year of university level courses assembled entirely from OER. And they are, um, yes, uh, accessible to anybody around the world without a need to uh, log in, without a need to pay any money. Um, and not only is there course material there, but there's also um, a structure of technology that uh, provides learners with a, a free online personal learning environment using open source technology. And that, would, uh, that side of things will be picked up by, by Wayne towards the end of uh, this presentation. So I'm now going to um, uh, hand over to, to Claire, who's going to tell us a bit about the, um, the course itself, uh, but I will continue to be the, the slide master. Thanks, Simon. So um, we can see here a timeline of how the course has evolved. Um, in 2011, the OER Foundation initiated the uh, collaborative development of the Open Content Licensing for Educators micro course um, as a practical introduction to OER Creative Commons and copyright to empower educators to legally remix um, OER. Volunteers from the Wiki Educator Community, the Open Courseware Consortium, now OE Global, and Creative Commons all contributed to its development in an open wiki where the course was also hosted. 
And um, from March 2011 through to 2014, six cohorts of this course were facilitated by the OER Foundation with more than 3,000 learners from more than 90 countries. And with the philosophy of um, release early, release often, course activities and materials were regularly reviewed and refined in response to learners' needs. Um, then realizing that the 40 hour uh, micro course could not be used to qualify for full course credit, the OERU network started developing the Learning in a Digital Age course, often abbrevi abbreviated to LEADER, um, which incorporated the open content licensing um, material and other elements of digital literacy for the 21st century. So through international collaboration and um, an open crowdsourcing uh, invite for input, four micro courses were developed, including the one we're focusing on today, open education, copyright and open licensing in a digital world, which effectively became the successor to the OCL for Ed course. Um, in 2018, each micro course was recognized for assessment through the micro credentialing service at Otago Polytechnic here in New Zealand, with the whole leader course approved for transnational credit transfer at OER partner universities in Canada, um, the United States and the UK. And then 2019, uh, we introduced digital badges and certificates for each of the micro courses. And uh, very significantly, LEADER won the Commonwealth of Learning Award for Excellence in Distance Education Materials. Earlier this year, the New Zealand Qualifications Authority assess the course and considers it equivalent to 16 credits or 160 um, learning hours at level five on the New Zealand qualifications framework. So on the next slide, um, with digital badges having been shown to help build confidence and motivation, um, there's a lot of literature around that, we also offer learners the option to complete a basic knowledge test and earn a digital badge um, or a, and or a certificate of participation. And in this way, learners can scaffold from um, a no stakes knowledge test through to, to a micro credential. And then if they, if they want to, they can map those against um, formal transfer credit. In terms of adoption and adaptation, we have several examples. So at Otago Polytechnic, LEADER has been offered as a self-directed elective in three of our undergraduate programs since July um, 2019. In Papua New Guinea, Western Pacific University has introduced LEADER as a compulsory foundation course for all students. The OER Foundation is currently working with OE Global to host the course on OE Global's own course site. Um, some of the course has been incorporated into a design skills for OER sharing initiative for educators in the Pacific Islands. Um, that went live uh, about 10 days ago, <laughs> memory serves me right. And yeah, more than 1400 learners um, uh, enrolled in that course at the moment. Um, we've also been working with UNESCO and the ICDE in partnership with the French Ministry of Education and the French Thematic University to develop a French in instance of the Open Education Copyright Open Licensing course for um, Francophone Africa. And having demonstrated that it's possible to develop and host courses in other languages, discussions are currently underway 
around possible versions of the course in Hindi, um, Bahasa Malay and Italian. Um, so I am going to hand over to our esteemed colleague, Wayne, um, who will round this presentation off for us. Uh, kia ora everyone and thanks Simon and Claire for uh, bringing, bringing us up to date with the history of the Learning in the Digital Age course. Um, at the onset, I should just emphasize that when we talk about radical openness, we mean radical in the uh, original Greek sense of radix, the root uh, that our foundation is openness, rather than the alternative uh, of radical as revolution. So just uh, as a, a point of clarification before we get, uh, move ahead. Um, at the OER Foundation, uh, we are totally committed to free and open source software technology. Uh, we host everything we do on free and open source uh, technologies. Uh, we don't host any proprietary software whatsoever. Uh, in fact, a condition of employment uh, at the OER Foundation is that no staff members are in fact allowed to use proprietary technologies as a matter of policy. But that is our free, free choice. We don't impose that on, uh, on, on other folk around the world. And, and uh, many of you in the room who are very familiar with uh, free and open source software de development will be familiar with uh, these principles of the FOSS movement. Uh, we subscribe to open and transparent planning in everything that we do, uh, releasing early and re releasing frequently. Uh, in fact, all our meetings of the OERU network are conducted openly and transparently. We keep records of all our agendas in an open wiki uh, powered by MediaWiki. Uh, we are very into iterative design models. Uh, you'll be very familiar with the the, the adage and practice of, you know, achieve rough consensus and build running code. And that's the way we run here at the OER Foundation. One of the key facets of our work with developing learning in a digital age, and in fact, finding solutions uh, for educators around the world to be working with this stuff was really figuring out solutions for collaborative design and development. And that's one of the areas we, you know, free and open source software leads is in the whole question of robust version control. Um, if you've got developers uh, distributed all around the world, you need to figure out how you keep control of uh, revisions and improvements to software. But similarly, working with educators, we need to uh, figure out ways in which we deal with version control of collaborative developments. Um, if a group of educators are working together on resources within a learning management system, it's, it's hard to keep detailed track of any changes or adaptations that are made uh, through international collaborators. And so we had to figure out ways in which we could um, deal uh, with uh, aspects of version control that would be palatable uh, to average educators, um, you know, pushing educators into Git uh, is not necessarily an ideal scenario. Of course, the work that we've done is we've done our best to try and figure out how you design and develop courses for reuse and remix uh, using component-based uh, systems, um, which in fact is the power of the whole open source movement. Um, you know, amazing technologies like Moodle, which is our learning management system of choice, uh, rely on many components that were developed uh, by the open source community. Um, so, for example, Moodle didn't have to develop uh, open source database technologies in order to move their platform forward. Uh, we could build and stand on the shoulders of giants uh, that have you know, developed other technologies. So we needed to think about, well, how do we incorporate these com you know, aspects of you know, a component-based uh, solution for moving forward. And of course, committed to openness, uh, we, we, we like to help our neighbors. So everything that we do at the OER Foundation uh, in terms of the technologies we host, we actually publish the technical recipes for hosting any of the technologies that we have used in our ecosystem. So Simon, if you could uh, move on to the next slide.
So just so this is a brief overview of the, the, the authoring ecosystem that we use. Uh, in order to facilitate version control, we author all course content using MediaWiki um, on, on Wiki Educator, which is our instance of the MediaWiki software. Essentially, what we do is we build an outline of individual wiki pages, uh, which in, uh, individual collaborators around the world can work on and collaborate. But what the wiki provides us is detailed version control. Uh, we have a bunch of open source scripts um, that members can click on in order to publish to a WordPress website uh, that hosts uh, content using an OERU open source theme, which provides a mobile responsive uh, experience. Um, so that's the broad ecosystem that we use in terms of the publishing environment to deal with the uh, version control issues. And Simon, if you move on to the next slide. Uh, from, from the learner's perspective, in this particular course, Learning in a Digital Age, which is really about focusing on uh, developing capacity of the digital fluencies of uh, educators and learners, uh, we've decided to support a philosophy which helps learners to learn on the internet rather than learning via a single application like a learning management system. Uh, and uh, we've selected a number of best of breed open source technologies uh, to help learners interact with each other. And so, for example, we use Mastodon as a federated instance of you know, a, a social media website, an open source alternative to Twitter. We strongly encourage learners to uh, share the outputs and artifacts of their learning using their own personal blog sites. We have an internal commenting engine. Many of you will be familiar with the open source uh, uh, web annotation system uh, using Hypothesis, which um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with. We use a open source social bookmarking uh, technology uh, developed by Semantic Scuttle. And uh, our interactions are powered by the Discourse open source platform. And we have uh, systems within the ecosystem that uh, aggregate mentions and posts across all these platforms into a Twitter-esque like course feed uh, on a course website in, in Moodle that learners can keep track uh, of the interactions that are going on. Um, within our ecosystem, of course, we do have the Moodle LMS, which is our preferred learning management system platform. And a number of institutions have actually built uh, Moodle courses that reference uh, uh, the course content uh, hosted on this open ecosystem. So moving on to the next slide. Um, there are, of course, many, I'm not going to go into all this detail here, the bullet list, lists here, but there are, of course, many advantages to using a FOSS-enabled distributed learning ecosystem the most important of which I think is the agency that we can provide to learners to host and control and retain control of the content that they produce uh, long after courses have completed. So which is a powerful enabler for learners within this ecosystem. Uh, moving on to the next slide, taking time constraints into account. I, I, I know Gino is a tough taskmaster and will keep me within the time limits. Uh, so we'll move on to the next slide there. When we're doing well with time, um, you can take another three to five minutes if you wish. Oh, but I've got another 40 slides, Gino. <laughs> I'm, I'm, okay, just no, I'm, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. So in, in, in terms of thinking about uh, individual capacity, uh, one of the big advantages, both for uh, faculty members and academics that engage in this authoring process, as well as learners, is uh, through a process of activity-based learning through incremental design, uh, they improve their digital proficiencies in using the tools of the internet, uh, as well as uh, the complexities of open licensing and how uh, you do all these things, uh, really embracing the, the concept of free range learning out there on the internet and uh, learn by doing model. 
Uh, moving on to the next slide, please, Simon. Of course, there are many, many advantages for uh, institutions within our network uh, that are uh, experimenting with some of our technologies. Uh, being a charitable organization, we have a strong focus in supporting institutions in the developing world. And in fact, is one of the reasons uh, we selected a, a, a WordPress as a mechanism for publishing courses. And so for institutions who want to replicate uh, a course uh, in, uh, a publishing infrastructure, they could do so on a small, you know, digital ocean image for 20 or $30 a month to be able to publish and replicate any of OERU's courses. But uh, just by way of example, if anybody wanted to uh, uh, mirror or replicate the full suite of technologies we are using uh, within the OER Universitas network, uh, our total infrastructure costs for, you know, what we are hosting, which last year served well over 200,000 learners, uh, is under 9,000 US dollars. So there are definite advantages for institutions that are interested in experimenting in these spaces. But I think the big strength is uh, what we are doing through the implementing implementation of these radical it's sort of open processes is demonstrating a low cost, um, low risk, but high impact innovation environment for institutions willing to dip their toes in figuring out how to make the best of free and open source software technologies. So moving on to the next slide, I think I should be wrapping up soon. Gino, you'll be pleased with that, that I can complete within my time limits. Uh, waiting at waiting for this to come through given my challenging bandwidth connections uh, in rural New Zealand. We have similar mm. issues, um, <laughs> Gino, if you are uh, interested in knowing. Um, <laughs> so um, this is possibly just a, a, a catalyst for folk that are in the room uh, is really an open question. How else could radical openness uh, support all of us uh, in, uh, in open education. So thank you very much, uh, everyone, for the opportunity to share and um, looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Simon. And thank you, Claire. That was, that was wonderful. Um, I know that there's several comments and questions that have come in via the chat functionality. Um, I've not been able to see all of them, but I can definitely relay the fact that there's lots of excitement and um, I think sort of anticipation of engaging more with all of your content and your projects and your platforms. So from my side, thank you all for some wonderful presentations. Um, I'm actually going to ask some questions myself first and go through the order of the presenters and, and the sessions that they've presented for us. And then after that, uh, Moitza will help me to fill all of those questions and also help to relay the, the comments that you may have missed out that were in the chat. Uh, so firstly, I'd like to go to Sharonika and Sam. Um, Sharonika, you spoke about capacity building. And my question for you is, you, you mentioned that lots of this took place online. Can you comment perhaps on, um, the tools that were used, and then I have a follow-up question for you after that. Sharonika? Yeah, yeah uh, okay, uh, thanks, Gino. Um, actually, um, uh, or, uh, in the first instance, yeah, from the beginning, we used Moodle because Moodle is our learning management system. So the all uh, these online support was given via Moodle, uh, but most of the time it's blended, you know, you have to give, you have to give, uh, face-to-face, -face, a lot of uh, support uh, with face-to-face -face workshops as well, especially with the teachers. But the Moodle uh, LMS support was there. Okay, that's wonderful. <laughs> I see Moodle's um, popped up everywhere here, so it seems quite the fitting um, instance that we have this webinar. I wonder if that's how the organizers um, kind of put us all together instead of the UNESCO OER. Sharonika, <laughs> um, you also mentioned that um, there were the lived experiences of the practitioners and the researchers. Um, 
So my question there is, did this, like you said that this was published in, in one of your outputs, do you think that this helped like to sort of promote openness and um, the adoption and use and creation of, of OER amongst more people, hearing from, from people and their, their sort of humanizing experience? Definitely, uh, because uh, these experiences, now for example, we invited, uh, rather than us writing, we invited the practitioners themselves to write their uh, narratives, the experiences, right? Uh, for example, the, all the school teachers who continued throughout, they wrote their stories, we call them stories. Uh, sometimes they wrote in their native languages and we had to translate, but then we published all those as OER book. It's uh, available online and it's it was published in print also. The Open University supported uh, with the funding for that. Um, uh, then, uh, no, Rofody, sorry, sorry, Rofody project and some other books Open University supported. So anyway, all these books are uh, distributed uh, through the Ministry of Education. We distributed all these teacher stories among other schools. You know, so that, that's a motivation for the others uh, also to see stories of their peer teachers uh, so that they also, so these things are possible and these novel concepts to adopt them. So I think definitely uh, this uh, approach uh, supported in um, like uh, spreading it more uh, among the um, uh, practitioners. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. I'm 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 incredibly interested in in sort of the lived experiences of of practitioners in general, but especially open practitioners because sometimes there's such a distance between um, who we are and what we do and how we share who we are and what we do in what we do. So thank you for that. Um, maybe some, maybe you could uh, just respond. Like uh, I think I'm not sure if it was yourself or Veronica who who commented about some challenges in in the project um and and like i know that with oer very often it's in addition to what would be your normal sort of uh performance indicators or your role so um inside the normal roles or was this in addition to what the educators that you worked with and the researchers that you worked with had to do so that was teaching and oer sort of a merged endeavor yeah yeah, very much, very much part and parcel of what um, academics were engaged in doing. So we, we, we didn't want to come there and sort of start talking technology or talking about OERs per se. Instead, we wanted to talk about what is their core business? What do they do? So, you, you know, we had a bunch of people who were not from the education faculty, people who had been engineers or chemists or something like this, had no idea. I mean, you know, in 2013, when I started talking about OER, people thought that everything that was on the web was an OER. See, you're starting with that level of understanding of what we are talking about. And yet, this is an open university. You would think that they would understand the idea of open. So if, if Shireka can flesh up you know, uh, slide number four uh, while I'm talking, what, what we started to do was to develop a framework from our conceptualization of how you can engage people into the adoption of open educational resources. And this is where the idea of the learning engine came about. Now, if, you, if you're seeing that slide, um, the, you see the, the image, uh, there, there are a couple of boxes you know, top down. One of them says commitments. The other one says learning outcomes. The other one says learning context. The other one says learning scenarios. So th these things have got nothing to do with OER. This is the framing of learning and teaching. This is how any teacher goes about uh, developing the learning and teaching transaction. So you begin about what you're going to do in your subject. What are you going to do for your, for your students? And then you develop the learning outcomes from those kinds of commitments. And then you develop some sort of a context, you know, within which the subject matter needs to be understood. Then you develop problem scenarios, de develop activities, and develop assessment items related to that, and so on and so on. So this is all educational focus. On the side sits the the the, the wheels of the engine, if you like, and they they are the open educational resources. And I think Martin's presentation sits beautifully with it. So. 
what what I think Martin's doing, Martin and his team is doing is brilliant as I can see it because they're trying to put resources somewhere uh, on the site within Moodle and, and educators can focus on the, the education, the teaching and learning transaction, mm. which is their core business. And then once they're clear about what they want to do, once they're clear about a learning outcome, once they're clear about a learning scenario, then they go searching for the subject matter. So the subject matter becomes a support for the learning transaction. And this is the major shift that I think we, we need to bring about in every country. I've tried this in so many places. I've done this in Australia, I've done this in Canada, done this in Fiji, I've done this in Sri Lanka. Educators tend to, to latch onto content first. You know, you, you tend to find a textbook and then you teach to the textbook. We're saying, no, don't go to the textbook. Worry about the learning and teaching transaction first. Let's figure that one out. Once that is done, then you go and search for the content. And that content can come from, from anywhere. And, and the fact that in a Moodle supporting that, I think this is going to be a great winner, Martin. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm your greatest fan. So this, this is... Uh, this, this is brilliant. I think we're on the same page here. And, 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 and the research part of it, you know, uh, Gino, is where you're going is, is when we took academics through this activity, through this exercise of thinking to the learning and teaching transaction and searching for open educational resources, uh, at the end of it, we said, well, now tell your story. What was your story? So that the academic then, then tells the story of the journey through the process, you know, the lived experiences, as you were saying, and that is publishable product. That's what we've been doing. So this is, this, you. Is how you, this is how you bring about systematically systemic change. And that's what we went about doing it. But at the same time, you know, you need pressure from top down. You need rewards. You need motivation from top down. You need policies in place. So we also develop policies, OER, integration, adoption, integration policies, so that, you know, what we were doing in the classrooms, in the schools, could be supported by policy direction. So people say, if people were saying, well, why are you doing this? Then you can say, well, wait a minute, the institution is bought into this, you know, because there's a policy direction, there's pressure from the top, there's support from the top. So I think you need, you need both. Otherwise, people will get frustrated and say, well, you know, it's all very good for you to talk about this, but I'm not getting the support from senior management. So I think senior management needs to be on board in this one. Thank you. Those were um, exceptional responses. And I, I completely agree that we need to sort of try to activate an ecosystem around us and not try to live in and operate in, in sort of a vacuum where, where what we do is, is sucked into the system. But yesterday they were speaking about adding a sixth R onto um, the five R's of open. Uh, I don't know if you saw that, but we add the other one and it's recognition. And I think that that's something that's so critical, like in the systems that we operate in, because our work doesn't get us promoted. It doesn't get us uh, tenure. It doesn't get us um, an award. Um, you know, the recognition, I think, is, is very often just situated in the community. So we speak about our lived experiences with um, one another and we can share openly with one another. But when we share this with the institution, it sort of falls into a vacuous area. Uh, it's sucked in somewhere and it isn't amplified systemically. So thank you for that. Just one point, one final point, Gina, you reminded me that, that, that what we tried to do was to turn teaching into a scholarly activity. So at the end of it, you know, it's a publishable product. So anytime a teacher engages, engages in this process, it can turn, to be turned into a publication. So this ties into publication rewards and promotions and those kinds of things. So you see, you got, and, and you've got to sell this idea to senior management. So unless senior management recognizes that teaching scholarship can lead to promotion, it's not good enough. So I think once they recognize that and then you work with the teaching academics, then teaching becomes an exciting activity, isn't it? It's not just something you do for the day job, but it's something that is part of your scholarship as opposed to the research that you do in the field that you are experts in. Thank you, so like um, just, just to add, our vice chancellor himself was in the team. He, he was a student in the OER-based e-learning course with us as teachers, as the vice chancellor, 
So I'm just telling the institution's leadership support. Then at the MOOC, he, he voluntarily engaged as a team member amid all his work. He was a team member creating, and there were uh, other deans. Myself, I'm a dean. I was a dean at that time and another dean. So I think that also helped. Thank you so and, uh, much. Um, I, I, I have to just facilitate towards the next session presenters yeah, uh, yeah. because of time. Um, Today we were supposed to have four presentations, by the way. So having had only three and three remarkable ones at that, uh, it's meant that we've been afforded the luxury of more conversational time. Um, Martin and Paul, I'd like to just come over to you too quickly. I, I, I anticipate several questions um, coming your way in the galaxy that you both seem to have behind you. Um, so uh, from my side, I, I just see something like about Moodle Net, um, and I wrote in my comments here, it's like adding curation to your engagement with Open and, and with Moodle. So thank you so much. I, I see infinite possibilities for our university here at Mandela Uni. Um, my question to you both, perhaps, um, what types of support are available for users? Paul, I see that you've got that all those screenshots available. Is there real-time support, perhaps? Uh, That's a, sorry, Martin, go ahead. <laughs> you have a, more of an idea than I do. <laughs> well, um, so we... Do you mean support in getting it running and, and uh, ongoing use of it? Yes. And so on? Um, well, at, at this point, we're, we're still trying to prove the concept. I want to make sure that it actually works. It's actually useful. It's not just going to cr create another dead site out there on the internet. Um, that that it, it, you know, we really are still in the research phase. So this this first, at the moment, what you saw was like a beta version, a very early kind of minimum viable product. Um, uh, then we will continue um, uh, working on it, but. The, the, the actual team making it is very small. And at this stage for the next few months, we're building it up as an open source project, which means we want early adopters to come in who believe in the con, who can start to see the concept is working and then help us grow that. Like, cause there's a lot of things still missing and things we could still do, but I want the direction to be driven by actual practitioners here so that we're actually um, researching and developing it together, very much like Moodle itself. Uh, in, the, in the early days, particularly, um, it was just a small group of people using it in anger, so to speak. And that's what we want now. Um, so we don't have formal services plan. We haven't got a big support team. We haven't got a lot of that behind it yet. I, I, you know, Moodle's paying for the invest. We're investing in the team this, at this point. Um, if it becomes popular and successful, then I, I expect um, it might be possible that we have something like a Moodle cloud for MoodleNet, um, where you go, look, I want to have a MoodleNet site, click, um, and you would pay something small for the hosting of that. Um, and there could be various levels of support attached with that. But once you talk about support, you're talking about people's time, and people's time is valuable, and you should always pay for people's time. Um, you shouldn't pay for resources and software, uh, open source, open education resources, we all agree. Once you've paid for it to be made, it should be free, it should be everywhere, but you do have to pay people for support. So that's that starts getting um, a bigger thing that we'll get to once we know it's actually useful. Okay, thank you for that. Paul, would you like to add something to that perhaps? Yeah, I was just going to say that, yeah, while these things are ongoing, you can get us through the communities at uh, Moodle.org, of course, if you need to discuss anything. Um, we're checking the trackers daily um, and we're putting together the roadmap based on all this feedback. So it'd be great if people could get involved with that. Okay, thank you. That's wonderful. I'm asking because our learning developers are in the room as well. So um, I'm fast tracking a sign up and an integration into our um, LMS here. Um, and then another question, um, the version 3.9 you said um, is where this functionality kicks in. What if you've got an older version? Uh, upgrade. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, yeah, so there was uh, some, some integration code was put into Moodle LMS uh, in the, the version from over a year ago now in 3.9. So anything after that will work um, with the pushing back stuff back to the LMS. 
Um, okay. But okay. It, even even if you if you are stuck for an older version for whatever, it's you know it's okay. You once you get to the Moodle, once you find it something in Moodle Net, you can still copy and paste or do whatever you would normally have done in Moodle to get things in um, before. We're just trying to make it easier and better. Okay. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think that I'd like to just field a couple of questions to Clay and then to Wayne. And Clay, you spoke and Wayne referred to the, um, the philosophy of release early, release often. Could you comment on that, please? Because I think that's such a valuable little piece of philosophy that we can share with other people. Um from my perspective, so I'm also seconded as part of my role at Otago Polytechnic. I'm seconded for half of my working week to the OER um, Foundation for various projects. And yeah, uh, I guess from my perspective, the release early, release often has become a bit something in my mind for all the work that we do um, with Wayne. Um, he, he'll be able to say a lot more about it. I believe it comes from um, open uh, practices, open education practices. Okay, Wayne, feel free to jump in. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a big topic, right? Um, I mean, I think this represents the issue of crossing the chasm from sharing to learn to learning to share. Um, and what I mean by that is, as educators, we all appreciate the value of sharing open educational resources. And so many educators are comfortable with sharing uh, learning outputs uh, for the benefit of others, right? Um, but the whole notion of actually learning how to share is, is a cultural shift. Um, and, and, and one which is hard to make in higher education because the reward systems are based on individual outputs, right? Uh, you are measured by your research output in, you know, esteemed journals as working as, you know, an, an, an individual academic. Whereas the whole open source kind of movement is a, is a very different culture. You earn your stripes mm -hmm. and your kudos to what you've actually shared. Um, any free and open source software developer worth their salt who is embarking on a new project, the very first thing they will go and do is go and see what open source code is available that I can use and integrate into the application I'm developing. And that's not the first thought that you know, comes into the mind of an academic who's engaging in OER. So I, I think it's this cultural shift, right? Um, you know, learning, learning how to share. And um, it's a big step and uh, it's daunting for many. But, um, you know, taking small steps, we can cover a lot, you know, a big distance, right? Um, so it's a good question. Well, thank you. And thank you for that response. Um, you also mentioned earlier on building individual capacity, which is a, a, a sort of theme where I'm particularly interested in. Um, with radical openness and, and the fact that you had a lot of sort of student facing uh, platforms that you shared there. Um, is there a list of alternate sort of tech and tools that you you sort of uh, engage with via your educators that could be shared perhaps? Sure. I, I mean, one of our philosophies at the, at the OER Foundation is to make sure that no learner uh, will ever be required to purchase a proprietary software license in order to engage and access learning. Um, and, and, and this is very deeply um, uh, in our, our philosophy of, of, of provision. Um, so we make sure that uh, all learners will be able to complete all learning activities using free and open source software. Um, and we design our courses around the range of tools that, that are available. But by the same token, we, we do respect freedom of choice. Um, and that is, we, 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 we will not deny learner success for those who choose to use proprietary solutions in completing their learning activities. But at the very least, we ensure that every learner, and particularly we're serving a large audience in the developing world, will be able to complete everything 
uh, without uh, the need to purchase a proprietary software license, or in fact sacrifice their personal data by subscribing to the so-called no-cost services that are, are available on the internet. And um, this is one of the things we, uh, you know, try to achieve as, 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 we, as we're moving forward. So yeah, we're happy to share, you know, anything we have uh, to help a, our neighbors. And um, let me just leave it there. What I'll do is I'll, um, afterwards I'll share a link to the course that we've been talking about and particularly I'll share a link to the pages which explain the different platforms that um, we suggest our learners use so that you'll uh, you'll see them there and how they fit together. Thank you, Simone and Wayne. Um, Simone, it would be good if you could post that on the OEG Connect pages so that yes. um, they, they are available there for all because this will yes, soon we'll be released. Thank you so much. Moitza is our uh, rapporteur for this event. We've still got... Uh, 13 minutes before our session is over. So let's have Moitza uh, pop up and maybe help facilitate uh, the questions which were in the chat and directed from participants to all of you. Over to you, Moitza. Thank you for helping out. Thank you, Gino. Happy to help. Uh, a great discussion so far. Um, actually, some of the particular questions that popped up in the chat line have already been uh, answered in the, in the chat line itself. But I must say that some of the questions that were not answered in the chat line were actually incorporated partly in your questions in the discussion that you've held so far. So still, there is still a lot of questions. Don't be afraid. There, we, we will fill up this 13 minutes uh, that we have. And my suggestion is, if you agree, uh, those questions that really remained, I suggest to not go through them in the order of their appearance in the chat line but I've done my best to structure them from more, let's say, general or strategic questions towards more concrete uh, tool or action uh, oriented questions, if you agree. So we can start with, with the more strategic ones. And also- I love the idea. Yeah, great. As I'm the rapporteur, uh, rapporteur for this session, um, I would also uh, give a personal request actually as I was uh, asked by the organizers to report um, very much in relation to the OER recommendations, to, to UNESCO recommendations, especially the area of equitable and inclusive OER and capacity building, if the, the presenters could uh, relate as much as possible to, to the challenges, to the advantages, disadvantages of their projects in relation to those two areas of action, it would be really great. This can then make our report uh, even better than it will be uh, coming from your presentations. So uh, if you agree, I'll just start, Gino, uh, with the first uh, strategic, so to speak, questions related to Shironikas and Som's presentation. We got a, a great question by Igor uh, Lesko. And he said, I would like to know how you conceptualize systemic change within the scope of your project. We already heard a bit from Sharonika and Som regarding this changing of culture, scholarly practice, but still I think it's a really good question from, from the strategic perspective, how you defined systemic change. Okay, yeah. so uh, I think Som would be the best person to answer that question. Yeah, that's a hard one, sure, Nick, up, uh, you know, flick to, to me, isn't it? Uh, um, um, it? It's a tough question, and I, I tried to address it in, in a couple of my uh, comments earlier on. The top-down and bottom-up approach that I was talking about is part of the equation. But, but two things that, I, that I, 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 I want to highlight is, again, captured in slide four, if, if you go back to it at, at some point later when you wanted to is 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 um, adopting a, a educational focus approach that academics would relate to as opposed to coming from a, a technical perspective and an educational resources perspective so we started to have a conversation about learning and teaching which is which is everybody's business so they understand it you know and um, and then try to demonstrate to uh, regular academics how open educational resources can be factored into the equation without changing uh, the emphasis on on learning and teaching and assessment. So, so we had a we had a, a, a plan for the orchestration 
of uh, the adoption of open educational resources. The second thing that was part of the equation was adopting a design-based approach. So what we, what we did was to follow through a very widely recognized approach of analysis, uh, design, development, and iterative testing, and then reflection on the process, which is what I was saying to Gino led to the production of uh, individual reflections and, and group reflections, uh, and subsequently into a, a publishable product. So our focus very much was on trying to help regular academics with their core business, which is learning and teaching in physics, chemistry, education, whatever. So we were not coming uh, uh, to the equation as a bunch of educational technologists or experts trying to shove something down the throat without any purpose. But at the same time, we had the backing of senior management. We had the support of policy directions. We had the support of senior management in how they would reward academics uh, for the engagement in open educational practices and the use of open educational resources. So systematic approach, but systemic uh, change. So that's how we were focused on, on bringing about systemic change, change across the organization by adopting a very systematic approach to what we were trying to do. Now, how successful have we been will be seen over a period of time, but as, as some of the data that, that has been reported elsewhere, not so much in this presentation, is that we have seen a significant amount of uh, change amongst people from uh, uh, negative zero, if you might want to call it, you know, no idea of open educational resource to actual use of open educational resources and the development of open educational resources as well. So significant change across the board from, from people who had, had no idea. We, we had people in our group who were not from the education faculty, knew nothing about the educational jargon that we were throwing around. Uh, but suddenly uh, engaging with open educational resources as if they were, they were from, from faculties of education or educational technology. That's Thank you, Som. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Som. Um, another question for your presentation came from Simone Wood. Uh, she asked, what support did you get from your institution or from government for these various OER initiatives? Any special funding? And let me just mention this also relates to the request for me as a reporter to just, you know, uh, uh, also cover a bit uh, whether funding, financial budgeting issues uh, are involved. And I would just really like to ask for really short um, uh, feedback, short responses so that we, we get also to the others uh, in the session. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so I'll respond to that because uh, actually all those are research projects supported by uh, other organizations like the Commonwealth of Learning, uh, SEMCA and the row for the IDRC. So they are like internationally funded uh, research projects, uh, not specifically uh, government uh, funded, uh, but the university itself, you know, the university uh, funded uh, in certain aspects. Uh, but the ministry was very supportive, but not in funding, but the support and, you know, we have to get the authority and, you know, permissions and all those things were there, but funding came from outside, yes. But they were not very big funding, uh, so would know. Uh, all those things were managed with very limited funding because we were dealing with these teachers and you know the teaching learning integrated with the existing teaching learning process. Uh, so I think uh, that answered it. Yes, yes, it has in, in, in my way. So it was not a lot of funding, but still this was not a barrier for you to proceed successfully with the, with the project, right? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a good point, I think. Uh, then over to Martin and Paul, uh, great presentation. What I would really like to ask here is about some good points, bad points, advantages, disadvantages uh, of your project as you see it from the perspective of equitable and inclusive OER. If you could comment a bit on this and if this is also in relation to the future challenges or future plans of your project. Yeah, very much. Well, it's a subject close to my heart. I, mean, I think anything that's open is 
better for equity. Um, you know, it allows more possibilities for getting the thing, getting the access to it and um, sharing it. And, um, and also for people to take part in modifying it and improving it and, and adding more equity. Um, so in, in the software world, you know, we often encounter accessibility as a major equity issue. And accessibility is, you know, something we spend a lot of time thinking about and working on. Um, as for the content that goes in there, it's going to be the content of the, like we aren't providing, we aren't, we aren't making content. We're just making a container for content. Um, we're trying to enable and empower people to start um, curating content in a nice, easy way. Um, I think, as I said in one of the questions, the answers there, I, I would love to get more involved with OER projects and show how MoodleNet can increase the social impact of a project. So somebody gets three years funding to work on creating some great content for a particular context. Great. Um, then what happens? And, and as you know, you probably, if you've been in this field for a while, there are hundreds of these projects littered back through history. And where is that stuff? You can't always find it. Sometimes it's put on a website. It's great for a couple of years, then someone takes that website down or whatever. Like who's looking mm. after it? There's no long-term sustainability for this stuff. It just, we have all these little funded projects. So I, I want to try and get us to think more sustainably. Where can we put it for the long term? Where can we put it so it's still around in 50 years? Um, and, and this is a step towards that. Um, so uh, with those projects, I, I'd love to people to start saying, well, yes, we're doing this. And we have a strategy for putting it into MoodleNet, um, which will look after the longevity and sustainability somewhat. Uh, and secondly, um, more access. You can maybe more people will find it. More people will have access to those things. Um, it, it will be easier for someone in a um, a uh, you know a, a country with not much funding for education to be able to use the very best content that everybody's working on and that the UNESCO are fully behind. It's a long, complicated okay. answer. Was that what you're looking for? Um, oh, oh, the one more thing, actually. Yes, a SDGs. So uh, the SDG, I'm a huge supporter of SDGs, have been for many years. I would love to see us as an as a open education, um, as open education proponents to explicitly make content that wraps SDGs into it. And by that, I mean all content. So an example I would use is like engineering content. So you're teaching engineers and it's about, you know, mathematics and physics and dynamics and statics and stuff like that. But in, those, in, the, in that content, which can be quite technical, you often can work in examples. So if you're going to be talking about building bridges, well, maybe make the example about building bridges in a very, in a, in a, you know, a, 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 a poverty stricken area that needs it? Or um, are we uh, building technology to open up opportunities? Or uh, are we overcoming racism? Are we overcoming, you know, like you, you can use, you can make examples that show, well, engineering is for good purposes. Um, and it's the same with every subject. Every subject can be applied to everything else. And in our content, we can work in SDG references, right? We can talk about equality, this, you know, gender equality in every subject. Um, and I think if we were explicit about that, and if we started making projects about that, and we started pushing it out through MoodleNet and those kind of initiatives to all the schools and all of the universities, so that a particular teacher with a particular class, if this great SDG infused content was a click away, it would start being used. It would start actually affecting the next generation. And so that's kind of my big plan, if you like, uh, where I'm just trying to work on some engineer, some of MoodleNet for that. But like, that's what I would love to see happening in the world personally. Thank you, Martin. That's a wonderful answer. Um, Moisa, I'd just like to ask our tech support a question. Igor, um, I know that we had an extra 20 minutes before, and since that 
presenter and presentation was not offered. Uh, do you mind if we take a couple more minutes? Yes, that's okay. Don't worry, Gina. Please proceed. We okay. Take Thank you, Kuzak. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm loving the conversation and, and the discussion, and I think it's really valuable inputs coming here. Um, so back to you, Moisa. Thank you, Igor. Thank you, Gina and Igor. They are really great to have a few more minutes. Martin, I like this um, suggestion, actually, the idea about taking into consideration the SDGs and the interactions between SDGs, and in this way also as, see it as an opportunity to promote OER and build capacity. Wonderful idea. We'll, we'll, this will get into the report for sure. <laughs> Um, we have a, there was a lot of conversation uh, if, uh, regarding your presentation, or, but the questions have already been answered in the chat line, so I will not repeat them here. It was really some technical stuff regarding the use of ModelNet, but still there are two questions. I will, uh, I will combine them into one actually, or just, I mean, read them one after the other. The first was by Koshala. It did not get a direct answer, as, at least as far as I can see in the chat. By Koshala, uh, the question is, uh, MoodleNet is a very interesting project and should make strides in the sharing of resources by removing barriers to access. I see many opportunities for our university. Once we create, but now the question comes, once we create our own server, would we be able to mark certain resources as shareable, but only within our university? And then there's the second question by Simone Wood, uh, which is also similar, it's a, it's a technical one, so uh, perhaps you can you can uh, consider it together with Koshalas. Uh, she asked, can you reverse the process? For example, take something from your own Moodle course and add it to ModelNet at the click of a button. Um, I'll, I'll keep going with this, Paul, if it's all right. Um, so yeah, look, the, 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 so ModelNet, <laughs> you, you can download an instance and put everything in it and have it connected to your Moodle and you never need to publish it to anybody. It can be completely local. So you don't have to be part of the Moodle network. Um, and so that's what you would do. You would, uh, and, and if you wanted to have a mix, you might have two Moodle net installations potentially. Um, I don't know, Paul can answer in future uh, and maybe it's part of that open source development as to whether we get more granular inside, inside it. But I feel like it would start adding complexity personally, and you don't want to add too much complexity to a system like this. You want to keep it nice and simple. So, um, it, you know, you could say to your start to your team, uh, look, this one's our local one, and if you want to make it public to the world, go onto Moodle.net and put it there, like on that instance. Um, the second question of definitely you will be able to push things from Moodle into Moodle.net. Um, but there is work to do there on uh, on how and um, and uh, you may some of you may remember a very early incarnation of MoodleNet from over ten years ago, and we actually had this feature in there, and you could push it to Moodle.net then, but it was it was not designed how it is now, and uh, didn't really uh, it, it didn't really work at all. Um, the, the problem is if you have a whole course with, you know, 50 activities and a whole lot of stuff going on and you want to push a whole course onto MoodleNet, uh, how does the person consuming that know what it is or understand what's in there? Or So you need, you need to kind of x-ray the thing and, and process it and, and give you a good preview of what's going on and potentially even load it up on a Moodle site so you can actually play with it and look through it and... Um, that's one, one thing there. Um, but it's quite easy in Moodle to capture any one activity or one resource or two or three or five or 10 or 50 uh, into a backup and, and have that as an OER. Um, but we, we don't want to do too much work around there until, we just, until we've shown that the basic concept is actually something people want and is working. I think from the responses so far, um, we can confidently assume people want this. <laughs> I, I hope so. I've been dreaming of this for like 10 years. You know, it's always been there and I, I just haven't, we've had other things to do, but um, um, and, uh, Paul has taken the team really, even, even in the past three months that he's been with us, that's really through this final push to, to get this version up. And I'm really happy with how it's coming together now. Okay, thank you so much. I see that Andrew's just um, posted the link to the Becoming an Open Education Influencer course, which was 
my my online course, by the way, um, <laughs> which is what you were speaking about, which is linked integrally to the SDGs. So this is part of the Open Education for a Better World pro um, program, which is sort of really embedded in addressing the SDGs directly through making content. Um, back to you, Moitza. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the last couple of questions, or, or one combined question is in relation to Simone's, Claire's, and Wayne's presentation. Uh, and actually, I would like to pose this question and also bring this uh, to, to the report I will uh, uh, compose of this session. So towards the end of the presentation, I think it was Wayne's part, you mentioned the advantages uh, for the learners. And is it possible for you to reflect a bit or elaborate a bit on this uh, from the perspective of the UNESCO uh, OER recommendation, the equitable and inclusive OER and capacity building, both areas from the advantages for learners? That would be really uh, good for the report, if possible. Well, yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, an important question. And um, in the spirit of inclusiveness, um, rather than me trying to respond to the question, I'm wondering if I could maybe open it up to uh, some of the participants who are in the room, uh, because I'm particularly interested in finding out how radical openness can support, uh, you know, open and inclusive education. And there are many experienced colleagues in the room. I see Dr. Ramesh Sharma and uh, Professor Eba Ossa uh, Nielsen, uh, who are with us in the room, and I'm sure there are many others. And maybe just if they want to put up their hands, if their microphone enabled, um, to open up the floor to, to colleagues in the room, um, to, you know, to help elucidate that question, if I may be so presumptuous. <laughs> I think it's a wonderful idea. Um, feel free to put your cameras on and we can have this group chat. Um, I, I like this idea of just facing one another as well. Who'd like to go first? Anil, I see you've got your hand raised. Would you like to go? You can put your camera on if you wish. It's not a requirement. Uh, hello, everybody. Can you hear me? We can. Yeah. Uh, the net is pretty slow here, so uh, I'm not going to on my camera. Otherwise, it will get. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I'm Anil from uh, Kerala, India. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, this is my first time I'm joining OEG and conference, so it's great to know a lot of things from you. I'm learning a lot of things from you all. Uh, uh, in, uh, here in Kerala, I'm running an open education project where we are trying to create an open education platform where we are going to deliver open education resources and learning services together on a single platform. So both resources and learning services. Services like uh, mentoring, tutoring, coaching, conducting webinars, seminars, training workshop, training and workshops for both both educators and learners. So people here are not, not that much aware of open education in OER and we are trying to create awareness among them. And uh, what we are trying to do now is we are trying to pull as many open education resources from internet, from various uh, international and national projects and we are pulling it and we are distributing it to schools and libraries where they can access it offline. So many schools, they don't have uh, in network connections and uh, there, are, uh, there are connectivity issues. So what we are trying, uh, trying to do now is we uh, take off all these resources and put uh, in store and install it in schools and libraries so that learners can access it for free. So we are not charging anything for the service or not for data because it's, it's all, almost free from it. So we have full Khan Academy offline videos, uh, simulations are there, Wikipedias are there, Vikishnaries are there. So we, uh, we are trying to pull as much as. And the next step will be to have our, our own content. We are trying to create our own content so that we can put in a cloud or uh, as uh, Martin put, uh, Doodle. we have already created a Moodle.net, I just created it, and we will try to share as much uh, contents through Moodle and all. So this is what we are trying to do, and it's not uh, that much easy for us to come. I mean, we are, people are not that much aware, even the funding part, we, we are, we are uh, trying to get fund from through crowdsourcing. So we were able to uh, um, 
fund around 75,000 Indian rupees, that means $1,000. So that's what the project is going and we have uh, around 50 of them right now, people, team, uh, we have an advisory board, uh, a volunteer leadership group is there and a core team is there and we are trying to set up a, a platform, ecosystem, pla ecosystem where everything can be accessed by the learners for free of cost. So we are not going to uh, uh, put the cost on it. So everything will be free, both resources and learning services. So that's a short about my program and uh, it's called Project SMART. Project SMART where SMART is an acronym smart means study materials accessed and transferred readily so as it's based on uh, on open resource they can access it and they can transfer take it away home uh, that's what we are trying to do thank you so much for the opportunity thank you anil um i i actually just posted into the chat there that uh, you you should be looking at the open education for a better world program um the joseph stefan institute in slovenia uh, Moita is involved there as well. Moita, perhaps uh, Moita is having to leave now as well, so uh, she wants to just say goodbye to everyone too. Thank you, Moita. You've been wonderful. Um, Anil, have a look at oe 4 bw um, There's an Eduscope that's happening in October. I think it's the 18th to 21st, Moita. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and sign up for that event, Anil. Um, there are several uh, of your compatriots from India who've been participants across the, um, the annual cohorts. And there's a wealth of already existing and high quality OER in text uh, and multimedia formats for you to use. You don't have to go out there and recreate the wheel. It's available for you. Um, okay. Ramesh, I Thank see you. that you've got your hand raised. Thank you, Zeno. Uh, I'd like to uh, share uh, uh, on two fronts. First, about Moodle. Uh, in this, uh, you know, pandemic time, since all the universities they were uh, forced to go online, so I have helped uh, some of the universities, and I know many people around here, and particularly when uh, they both have worked very closely, Professor Mudulika Kaushik. Uh, she is now provide chancellor in Usha, Mart Usha Martin University here. So, uh, and some other institutions, they were looking for the kind of open platforms for as to be used as LMS and for web conferencing too. So Martin will be happy to know that uh, I could convince uh, some universities and now they are very happy in running their uh, courses on Moodle. In fact, if there is a website, it is called as Maths Passion, M A T H S Maths Passion dot I N perhaps, and uh, this boy he got uh, he attended one of my training program, and after that he was so energized that he created this website, all blue color then um, class eight, nine, ten, eleventh mathematics course like that. So and when he informed me that uh, sir I got training from you and now I have created this website, I felt very happy. <laughs> so so then that is first thing, and then you know. I was surprised when the people, they were uh, uh, trying to go because to teach online some web conferencing tool and particularly when it is more than 100 because Google stopped uh, after shifting to uh, enterprise solution that uh, 250 uh, restriction was there and then they took it now. Zoom allows you 100 participants in the free version, Google also 100 and then when they want to go live then there was some difficulty, means live streaming on YouTube or other things. And I told the people that, yes, look, there is the Jitsi, J-I-T-S-I Jitsi, which is super easy. You just copy paste uh, uh, your uh, uh, the uh, key, uh, take from uh, YouTube and paste it there and you go uh, immediately from there like that. So uh, I was able to you know help some of the institutions. And second, uh, I consider myself as the uh, OER brand ambassador of OERU. I convinced some of the universities, colleges uh, in India and uh, in Pakistan, some other neighboring countries that uh, to join this network so that you can be benefited and you can also add. I like the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the quote by Wayne that uh, uh, from share to learn, move to learn to share uh, like that. So, uh, and very recently, one of my students for OE for BW project, she has uh, uh, created a course on uh, innovative pedagogies for uh, uh, gifted as well as solo learners. 
so that course has been very uh, popular and i think it is a very uh, interesting and important step towards inclusive education because here not only uh, some of the material we took from the already existing uh, sources but other things that we requested some of the real people who had their kids falling into that category and requested them that can you make a video uh, explaining that how did you manage means the education of your child or some other difficulties and we put them on the uh, as a free course means it was offered there and we intend to uh, you know have a rerun of that uh, in uh, next year after a few months so thank you ramesh you. thank you so much for that Wayne, I'm going to um, hand over to you for the last couple of minutes. I see you have your hand raised and then we'll do a quick closing and finish at 10 past exactly. Thank you. Uh, Gina, it wasn't a hand raising. This is an old age issue. I was wanting to uh, <laughs> signal an applause. So I wasn't putting my hand up for a question. So you can wrap up if you need to. <laughs> um, maybe if, if I, I can put this out there and, and say like there's a minute for each of the uh, presenters to say a final something, uh, please be brief and to the point and then we will wrap up in that last few seconds. So over to you, Sharonika. We can see you now. You are muted though. Okay, so finally I managed to uh, put down the video uh, using my phone actually, the, the issue it was with my laptop. Anyway, it's a great uh, experience. It was a very great session and thank you so much for moderating me so well. And I'm very happy to have presented our experiences and a lot of discussion went on. And I hope the discussion will continue among the group of open practitioners. Thank you so much for giving this opportunity. Thank you. Over to you, Martin and Paul. Uh, I'll, look, I'll, I'll just say uh, uh, thanks for everyone for coming. I want to thank uh, Open Education Global is a tremendous organization bringing us together like this. This is how we keep the energy to fight the fight because we are in the minority and we are um, the, the people who can see better ways to do things um, against all this corporate mad divisive uh, capitalist stuff going on uh you know we, we need to stick together and we need to work together to, to to succeed so thanks and paul absolutely thank you paul? yeah i just wanted to add my thanks as well and thank you for those who are now on moodle now i'm watching you um just to see what you're doing uh, so yeah thanks for adding those resources and give us some feedback get involved yeah let's work together thank you you're welcome thank you over to you wayne oh let me, let me leave the last words to my colleagues, uh, Simon and Claire, who've done the heavy lifting and putting this together. So let me hand over to uh, Simon and Claire. <laughs> um, Bless you, oh, you. Uh, yes, it's been a great opportunity to share with you all. Um, yes, I'm quite excited by hearing about MoodleNet, uh, which I shall go and sign up to because, yes, the Tiger Polytechnic is also um, a Moodle user so um, and yeah we struggle with ways to get our academics to understand about OER and even when they like the idea actually using it um, is difficult so I can see that has great potential for um, for an, an easy way into uh, using and contributing OER more so that's one takeaway for me thanks very much to everybody. Claire? Thank you. Yeah, just uh, thank you to everyone um, for your input and for uh, your attention. I, I agree with Simone, uh, MoodleNet, um, I think could be really uh, quite, um, I don't know, know life-changing, perhaps too strong, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, in terms of getting our, um, our colleagues to um share resources and and really sort of not start that um ripple effect hopefully um yeah that would be amazing and some really thought-provoking um aspects of each um presentation so thank you 
thank you to you all. So um, I don't need to say much more. I think that it's it's quite evident that there are amazing opportunities going on in OE Global. Um, for the rest of you, uh, I present at 6 p.m. this evening, so that's eight hours from now, where I can field some of these questions that I do see coming about Bowie. Um, please look on the uh, OEG Connect pages for more information. You can type in the hash, uh, uh, a tag uh, Open Ed Influences and find out more about the course and what we do. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Igor, for being such a wonderful tech support. Thank you, Moitza, for a wonderful rapporteering um, engagement. Uh, it's always a pleasure working with you. Thanks to all of the presenters. Again, wonderful, wonderful work. And um, yeah, I look forward to seeing more of you all across the span of OE Global 21. From our side, thank you and goodbye.